now to the business at hand. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bruce Forbes to you. Um, he is a research professor at the Global Change Research Group um, in the, at the Arctic Center of the University of Lapland in Finland. Um, he grew up in Vermont. Well, New England, Northeast, Northeast all over. <laughs> uh, um, um, but he, he's also the docent of plant ecology and biogeography at the University of Oulu in Finland. Um, and he's been working on um, the ecology and geography of northern high latitudes with a special emphasis on permafrost regions. Uh, it's great to read these, these uh, bios and what people are working on because I think half of your bio are words that I probably use either have never used in conversation <laughs> or use like once a year. Um, so, you know, the, here in the south, the, the polar uh, oh, yeah. environs are out of our you know, normal, I think, <laughs> thought process. Um, uh, so his experience is circumpolar. There, there's a word I've never used before. <laughs> Uh, encompassing studies of rapid land use and climate change in Alaska, the Canadian, High Arctic, and various regions of northern Russia. Uh, and northernmost, Fenoscandia. There's another, another one. Another one. I've never ever used before. Uh, his approach is strongly interdisciplinary and participatory, aiming for the co production of knowledge, particularly concerning local and regional stakeholder-driven research questions. So, you know, what do um, the natives of the Arctic, you know, how do they conceive of, of the challenges and issues and having them uh, work together with them to formulate those questions. And so that's really what we're going to hear about. Um, Professor Forbes is also a member of the editorial board of the journals Ecology and Society and Polar Geography. Um, he is contributing author to the Polar Systems Chapter for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, the Fifth Assessment Report of 2014, and lead author of the chapter on resource governance for the Arctic Council's Arctic Human Development Report, uh, 2015. Uh, he holds a PhD in geography from McGill University in uh, Montreal and um, adjunct positions as institutional fellow at the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth um, and um, research scientist at the University of Arctic, at the Institute of Arctic Biology, University of Alaska. So um, he flew all the way here from Finland to join us uh, and uh, we're just so thankful. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thanks, uh, everyone. So, yeah, it's true. Uh, a lot of people may not know the areas I'm talking about today. So, as a geographer, I'll I'll have plenty of maps. <laughs> uh, I had a the guy driving me up from the airport from Alabama was from Alabama. We had a great we had a great talk about NATO and um, the Baltic countries and the stuff going on now in Russia. When I was invited here a year ago, you you couldn't make this stuff up. The daily news now about Russia is just amazing. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to touch a little bit on that. What I'm really going to talk about is uh, extreme weather events uh, in that part of northwest Russia that was on the Barents and Kara Sea and how this is starting to look like more a long-term pattern. So uh, it's becoming a, a climate issue rather than a weather issue. And the issue when I started working up in uh, then Soviet Union was oil and gas development. And it has, the narrative has changed over time. What are people concerned about? Uh, now, the extreme weather, uh, believe it or not, is, is something that has challenged them. So I, I start with a couple of headlines. How, who, who noticed any or some of these? This, this is just about a month ago. Uh, these headlines from, yeah, Fox News, Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, Washington Post. That was uh, 2016 was the third year in a row setting a record in 2014 and 15 back to back. The statistical uh, likelihood of that was so remote, <laughs> uh, the, the, the climate modelers just couldn't believe it. And now we have a third one 
in a row. So I just put that in as a, as a backdrop. And there's even one there about the spiking temperatures. There was open water uh, at, the, at the North Pole in November, and that, that was making headlines too. So I promised a map because um, I don't believe everybody may know the regions I'm necessarily talking about, but uh, I came from here about the L in Lapland. That's where my university is, and I, I live uh, there up about 20 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in Finland. But uh, I started working over here in what's called the Amal Nenets Autonomous Ovkrug in the waning days of the Soviet Union. I start, actually started studying it already uh, around 1985, a couple of years before Gorbachev gave his speech in Murmansk, uh, which then was the pre set the template for what became the Arctic Council. Uh, but that red circle there uh, is uh, what's called the Amal Peninsula, and I'm going to focus most of my discussion today, and particularly this area here. Uh, this is what has been locked in ice from rain on snow events for about once per decade, uh, going back the last hundred years. We're doing oral history work, then it's, we've identified all the years to World War II so far, but they go back further. But the one in 2000, winter of 2013-14 set the record. Uh, about uh, more than 61,000 reindeer died, and I'm going to focus on that today. So the white areas you see here, these are all areas uh, where reindeer are herded. Uh, reindeer is the same species as caribou, and it goes all the way around the Arctic, or the circumpolar north. There's reindeer or caribou, Rangifer tarandus, the same species, but these are, these are privately uh, owned animals, or here, a mixture of state and privately owned. And to give you an idea, there's about um, 300,000 animals just on the Amal Peninsula, though there was before this, about 275,000 just before the ice storm, the last one, and about 700 and uh, now about 750,000 in the whole Okrug. So that, add that together with the other reindeer herding areas and you have, you have a couple million animals. And then if you looked at another map, you'd see where's the oil and gas coming from in Arctic Russia. Uh, oil here, there's a Varende uh, terminal here, and natural gas coming from here. So this is what I started working up here in the late, uh, early 1990s, and they're building a big liquefied national, uh, natural gas plant there to start to export natural gas to the Western markets. And there's already a pipeline running, uh, opened in 2012 from here uh, down to the Gulf of Finland. That's called the Nord Stream Pipeline. Just to give you some background. So this is how it looked in uh, July 1991 when I went up for my first field work in what nobody knew at that time was the last summer of the Soviet Union. And, uh, the project I'm uh, reporting mostly from today, there's two different projects. One recently ended called RISES, which stood for Resilience in Social Ecological Systems of Northwest Eurasia, and Humanor is on uh, human and animal agency uh, in Northwest uh, Russia and North, Northern Fennoscandia. So these are uh, the nomadic Nenets camp, what it looks like, and our, our main point here is that we're, we're weighing climatic versus non-climatic drivers and uh, looking at societal change because the, the prevailing dogma now is that the climate is warming fast and Arctic ecosystems are considered fragile and therefore Arctic indigenous peoples are considered at risk. But we look at it more, <laughs> well these people have been here for uh, a couple thousand years, herding reindeer for uh, most of that time. So they've, they've lived through the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age and all kinds of things, and um, I doubt that this extreme weather is really going to push them into a new state, but that's what, we, that's what we start to look at. So our first question is, climate change really the dominant driver in northern Eurasian pastoral social ecological systems? And then what role have people and animals played, and at what time in spatial scales? I put this slide up and I ask you to notice those are all the reindeer uh, for belonging to this family in the background. But in the <coughs> foreground where the camp, notice that there's no shrubs here. We're going to look a bit later at the woody plants. The, the shrubs are the trees of the tundra, and there's no shrubs here uh, where the people are. So people and animals are having uh, an impact, at least at the local scale. And then how important are other non-climatic drivers? Things like governance, legislative regimes, markets, and surprises. And, uh, Example of a surprise would be the Chernobyl 
incident of 1986, which uh, happened in Chernobyl, but the fallout started to be detected over Finland and then actually started to fall out over Sweden and had massive impacts on the Swedish uh, reindeer herding economy for the indigenous Sami. And we work in both regions in these projects. We work in uh, northern Fennoscandia with Sami, we work in West Siberia with the Nenets. And then we try to look from the indigenous perspective, what are the main risks? What are people thinking? How are they going to continue to coexist here when there's rapidly developing oil and gas? Uh, activities and the climate is warming. How are they going to continue to do what they've been doing? Because they want, they, they're not, they don't want to leave. They want to stay right where they are. So to get at this, we need to use participatory methods, uh, which means we come embedded. Uh, and you can't, I use the term community because it's a Western term, North American, but there <laughs> the communities are mobile. They're really family units, um, nuclear families. So um, children, uh, parents, grandparents, outside of the school year. During the school year, uh, kids are in boarding school, but uh, as long as they can get out at Christmas and long holidays and summer, they're out there because you can only learn reindeer herding by doing. But in northern uh, Finland, Scandinavia, Fennoscandia, and Russia, there's really not a long history of this kind of research. When I came over there from uh, North America, in the um, beginning of the 90s, no, nobody knew what I was talking about when I talked about co-management. So things we take for granted in uh, the Arctic here did not exist there. So as a result, there's not very much trust in reindeer governance. People place very little stock in what the government tells them, because the government tells them how many reindeer you can have, how much they weigh, uh, where they should be and when. And uh, It's much more strict in Fennoscandia and Russia, particularly in Soviet times, but continuing to this day, they let the Nenets, uh, the, the um, administrative footprint in Yamal was very light. So these slides are not from uh, West Siberia, but it's just to show how we do this work. Um, and I use example of uh, Sami, these are this uh, Sami reindeer herder here we work with. So ideally participatory work involves indigenous peoples in all the research phases, planning, field work, data analysis, and interpretation and then finally dissemination. That book I showed earlier, um, uh, Reindeer Management in Northernmost Europe, we had, we had Sami co-authors, reindeer herder co-authors contributing that book. But here they are uh, doing things like setting up meteorological and albedo uh, monitoring uh, stations, uh, snow, snow depth monitoring, uh, fences for excluding uh, reindeer to look at different levels of grazing uh, impact. And this is, this is um, means herders are involved at, at all stages. And uh, the dates are important here because you look, this is on the Norwegian uh, Finnish border up in northernmost Finland, late October 2013. That, that should be snow covered there. We, we got up there by four wheeler. And then about exactly oh, just a week later, early November, a year later, there was just the light snow. And we, we were almost going to go up there with four wheeler, but we, we didn't. We <laughs> it snowed the day before we went up, and we went up by uh, snow machine, but this is a kind of pattern that the, the permanent snow is coming later. Uh, it's, it's not lasting as long in the spring, it's generally not as much, and then you have these periods of uh, rain on snow uh, coming during the winter, and that means the winters are not as cold as they used to be. So these are data from uh, NASA and the Goddard uh, Space Center looking at about 40 years of temperature trend data. Uh, in the different seasons and year round. So there's the annual means. There's uh, spring there, winter here, fall, and summer. And this circle hones in on that area I had in the first map. So this is uh, northern Fennoscandia here, Yamal's here, and the Nenets, Okrug, uh, in between, and Kola Peninsula there. But look at winter. This is uh, the red is getting up to four degrees Celsius, and dark red even warmer. Look how much warming there has been uh, over the Arctic Ocean and over uh, the Barents and Kara Sea, where we are going to be talking about uh, during those 40 years. There's been a lot of warming in all seasons, but particularly in winter. And uh, indigenous herders, Sami, Nenets have been observing all kinds of changes. Uh, in a qualitative way, we try to quantify what they observe. But I'll, I'll show a, a short film. Um, on this topic of rain on snow. And this was actually 
filmed by the uh, European Environment Agency for the COP15 way back in 2009. We we're now up to COP22. Uh, I was just telling Dan I was at the COP22, um, COP uh, the start of the COP22 discussions were in Marrakesh, and I was there presenting these data because they had a session on global indigenous people's knowledge of climate change and um, how different people, indigenous peoples around the world are dealing with this matters. But this was made back for COP15 uh, in 2009, but I, it's about eight minutes, but I wanted to show it now because it's actually become more relevant, not less. The things that the, and these are Sami reindeer herders here in Sweden talking about these issues, but the issues they raised then are actually even more salient now. A lot of people have the view of nature, that nature is cruel and, and hostile. But I think that nature has, like a human, different sides. Sometimes it's on a bad mood, sometimes it's on a good mood. So I think that to accept both the good and the bad parts of nature, then you understand the nature. So I think a reindeer herder has learned to accept both parts and always to adapt. Either it's hot or cold or good weather or bad weather. So in one way you are adaptable. The Sami people have practiced traditional reindeer herding since the 17th century. Reindeer herding is more than a profession, it's a way of life. The life of the reindeer herder, it is partly it's very hard because during those times that the reindeers are really migrating or moving from one place to another one, or the most intense working parts, then you can have up to two or three days without any sleep. Then if you have bad weather at the same time, so sometimes it's very hard, but often, and the most part of the reindeer herding is a very nice way of life. To be a good reindeer herder requires many skills. First and foremost, the herders must know their reindeer. This comes from close observation of the animals throughout the year. The herder must know the behavior and movement of the reindeer and understand how wind, geography and climate will affect their behavior and movement. Uh, reindeer herding is a form of agriculture and meat production and this means a, a very narrow set of uh, issues from a, a management perspective but from a Sami perspective there's uh, a lot more involved uh, in terms of culture uh, and one of the problems is it's just not so profitable anymore and uh, climate change may make uh, that more of a issue. It may decrease the ability to make enough money to even keep reindeer herding. The reindeer herders used to live in a lavu, a portable tent that is the house for the family. Today they live temporarily in the mountains in small solid houses. During the winter the village is mainly inhabited by the herders, but in the summer all the family live there. 83-year-old Nils Thomas Laba is the oldest member of the Laba family and is today retired. He's been a reindeer herder his whole life and has been able to observe big changes in the climate. I want to speak about the changes in the weather, the changes from earlier times until now. The first snow came in October. That used to be normal. Today, in October and November, there is rain and wet weather that creates an ice layer. This ice layer does not melt. It stays the whole winter. A cold winter with deep snow is very bad. It is when reindeers starve to death. The things that the climate scientists started predicting in the uh, 80s have now become a bit more uh, normal. We could even say that the uh, fall comes uh, later. The, the permanent snow on the ground is coming later each year and the springs are coming earlier. Uh, that means uh, snow is melting out sooner. And it also means the temperatures just aren't as cold in the winter. 
The warmer and wetter autumns are making reindeer herding especially difficult. Today, Nicholas Lapper and his older brother are running the family business and can see the direct effects of changes in the climate. If you have a condition that, will, that is coming more and more often now, it's rain on ice. If you have a layer of snow, about 15 centimeters, and then you will have a rainfall for one day, it will eliminate the level of snow. It will go, the snow will go together. And of course, the water will go through and go to the bottom. Then that water, if there will be a cold weather again, will freeze to ice. And that surface will make that the rain there can still cross the, the surface. But then you have all the lichen. Everything is, is in, inside ice. And when the rain there eats that one, it will get too much water in the stomach. And then it will die, if it will be forced to eat it. The losses during a winter with no access to, to, <laughs> to the soil, it can be catastrophic. You can have 10,000 reindeers in an area, and during that winter you can lose up to 90% of it. So you cannot do anything because the stomach system of a reindeer is that if it doesn't have the right food level all the time, the bacteria die, and then you cannot do anything. They will die. The increasing frequency of what we call, scientists would call rain on snow events or thawing and refreezing events, uh, this has become more widespread uh, across the northern hemisphere. But of course, here where we have reindeer herding, um, that, that's a big issue. Uh, another one is more snow coming later in the winter. That means that uh, you have deep snow in the spring and it's harder for animals who are already weak, maybe from a couple of these icing events, it's harder for them to dig through the snow and get to the fodder. The problem with the water on snow, it's a, it's a very enormous, uh, it's a very serious problem. A lot of areas now, Reindeer herders are trying to get artificial fooding to get to, to, to get the reindeers to survive. Yes, that is a short-time solution, but artificial fooding will not be a long-time solution because there is not the economy to get the fooding artificially. The first global review of reindeers has shown that populations are declining almost everywhere they live, from Alaska and Canada to Greenland, Scandinavia and Russia. Over the last 20 years, numbers worldwide have plunged by almost 60%. For Sami, the, the main challenges for climate change uh, come in two spheres. One is the direct uh, interaction with animals, making sure they, they get enough uh, feed and survive the winter in a healthy form and give birth to healthy calves. The other uh, comes from the other land users. This is not uh, just a Sami area. There is uh, forestry, there is tourism, uh, there's all these other things going on that we can't ignore and the Sami can't ignore. So if we add climate change on top of that, it's another level of stress and another issue that may make it, uh, if it's a marginal uh, livelihood already, just maybe making enough money to survive till the next year, climate change may be something that can push it a little bit over the edge. So that was from northern Sweden, and uh, that that fellow, that uh, young uh, reindeer herder, is one um, I work with. Uh, we actually didn't consult on that. We were uh, we were told afterwards <laughs> that they had, uh, they had interviewed him, and it just it overlapped very well the things we were describing from the scientific perspective and from the herding perspective. Uh, I don't have such a film from the Russia, but essentially the herders have been experiencing the same thing, that the, the, the rain on snow events have become more uh, intense. So uh, these uh, images show that the reindeer is kind of at the center of at life. In the uh, Millennium Assessment, they came up with this term provisional ecosystem services. So that's what the, the reindeer provides. It provides um, food clothing, shelter, and even companionship. As uh, the Sami have a system of earmarking, the Nenets don't. They know all their animals by sight. Uh, and one, one herder may have up to 3,000 animals. So when they mix, if the herds mix, they go in and they agree who's animal. They, they really know uh, how, how their animals 
uh, look. But I would put a caveat that, that, that reindeer is the iconic species, but fish are also critically important. During the summer migration, people are not actually eating <coughs> any animals. The reason is that all the furs are still uh, used either as clothing or for tent coverings or for, you see them on the sledges too, uh, and as bedding. Here there'll be reindeer uh, furs there. So all the, all the furs are used, so the main form of uh, protein during the summer migration is fish from the rivers and lakes. And the other thing going on, I put the acronym in here, people may not know, this is social ecological systems. Um, but the Nenets systems have had to adapt uh, in real time over the past 20, 25, 30 years to a lot of oil and gas infrastructure right on their land. So they literally have to migrate right through uh, the largest and first gas field to, to develop is at uh, Bovodankovo. Um, and that's where these, uh, these slides are taken from. So literally, uh, there's a river that runs through, two rivers that run through the um, gas field, and some of the brigades have to migrate uh, right through both of them. So um, we use a resilience framework to look at this that may not be a familiar term to uh, many people, but what it means is um, through, through their own agency and adaptive capacity, they make uh, ways to cope with all these changes. They're not going anywhere. <laughs> and like, the infrastructure is not going anywhere. In fact, it's spreading. So it's, they're becoming more and more squeezed in terms of the available territory uh, and how they manage there. These are summer pastures. As you can see, there's no uh, snow here. So they're moving all the reindeer through there, but they're not slaughtering any of those reindeer. They're getting them um, up to the Arctic Ocean, and, and they turn around and go back, but what they are doing is uh, a lot of fishing there. Um, fish is the main food during the snow-free season, so you have fish for breakfast, fish for lunch, uh, fish for dinner. So when you're doing this participatory work and you're there for uh, a long time, you better be prepared to eat. It's very good. Uh, this is a sika or seek, uh, white fish. Uh, there's lots of it, and just as there are with the reindeer, uh, there's a lot of knowledge uh, involved in managing these fish stocks. A uh, typical herder, this is a brigadier in his mid-50s, he'll have about 10 years of uh, fishing data, I would call it, in his head. So he knows which lakes and rivers are underfished, which are about right, and which are, uh, need to be left alone, have been fished enough and ha have to be fallow. And they have to manage this. Uh, there's no fences there. They all know whose territory is whom, so that's been a bit scrambled by the uh, new roads and infrastructure coming in, but they still have, they know whose territory is whom uh, and where they can fish and where they can't, um, and have to pass on all that data uh, to the next generation. So particularly among the older people, there's a strong consciousness about this uh, fishing knowledge, and the timing, location, and duration of efforts are all considered carefully daily. So Every day, because you're moving camp during summer, every 24 hours, you have to break down and you have to get enough fish uh, to feed everybody. And if you have dogs, uh, which help herd the animals, I don't know if there's any dogs. No, no dogs there, but there's dogs. Oh, there's one. <laughs> they have to be fed, too, because uh, the dogs are an important part of the herding system. So I put these photos in to show uh, the importance of children when you're there. Outside of the school year, as I said, in these photos are in summer. There's uh, kids everywhere. One thing that happened, what you saw in the, uh, when it went from Soviet Union to Russia after 1991, a lot of the Arctic emptied out. And uh, reindeer herding in some places actually collapsed, like Chukotka. Uh, and there's different reasons for that. But many places lost population, but Yamal actually gained population. So the number of full-time nomads uh, in the tundra and the number of reindeer has actually increased and it's, it's increased fairly steadily uh, and the reasons are that what well, people say well this is a it's a it's a tough but uh, very rewarding way of life like you saw the Sami reindeer herd said this, this is a hard way of life but it's very rewarding and they, more and more people after the break of the Soviet Union saw this as it's actually a stable <laughs> you can count on this because we've been doing this for uh, centuries and we're still here so 
It's a bit different, though, if you go to the other side of the URLs in the NAO here, that's an acronym for Nenitz Autonomous Okrug, um, which is the same culture but west of the URL, so it's considered part of Europe, and this is part of Asia. There, because of Soviet-era uh, labor policies, men, uh, women and children were largely pulled out of the tundra, and there was a shift to, um, to shift labor. Uh, and they've had trouble since then putting the nuclear families back into the tundra. So Yamal, as I said, because of this light footprint of collectivization, has fared very well. And one of the reasons they're doing so well now is because the high numbers of children uh, continuing to choose reindeer herding and the nuclear families are intact. So while we were there doing this oil and gas work, um, herders, both east and west of the Urals, uh, herders started telling us that one of the things they noticed was the shrubs that were increasing. These are willow, mostly willow shrubs here. There's some alder and birch there too, but uh, these are, you see the reindeer are in there grazing amongst them. This is an important source of fodder, uh, but they did say that uh, the, um, in the tundra zone, these were growing up. Uh, since the 70s, they'd noticed this. And then there's been studies in both Fennoscandia and Greenland that actually normally, and we, we see this in Fennoscandia where, where I live, uh, the, reindeer, there's, the reindeer density is so high that they keep the shrubs uh, down, and this has been called overgrazing. Uh, but here we have uh, clear cases. They took us and showed us places where the shrubs are increasing, and they notice them because they go over the tops of the antlers of their animals, and then they don't want to let the animals go into those sites because during a migration, if you have to gather up your herd every 24 hours and you can't find some of the animals, uh, you're in trouble. So they have a very good marker for this. And during this period since World War II, the population has more than doubled. It was about 3, 300,000 at the end of World War II in the whole Yamal Okrug, and it's now getting close to 750,000. Uh, even with this icing event of 2013-14. So these are satellite images from uh, that area I was looking before. We, I was showing the border with, this is Finland here and this is Norway here, and what you see is a fence here. This is a, a very high resolution satellite image and this is just a snapshot from Google Earth, but I think you can see a strong uh, difference there. Would anybody venture what, why you see that sharp line there, what it's showing. It's um, not snow, these are actually uh, lichens. It's, it's lichens that the reindeer are eating in winter and uh, until Finland and Norway built this border fence, these animals from Finland used to migrate up to the coast in Norway, so they wouldn't be on this site uh, in summer, but after the fence was there they had to use it for both summer and winter pasture. And when you, you, you know what lichens are like? They're like these sponges. Uh, but when they dry out in summer, in a July day here, this is actually taken in the middle of July, um, it can be 25 degrees Celsius, you know, up maybe 80 degrees, very hot. And then those lichens are like glass. You step on it and it just, it just shatters into small little bits, and if you have a windier uh, day or rain after that, they're all going to wash down, and all those lichen particles are going to disappear. So it starts to look like a desert. The blue, for anybody who does remote sensing, it's the same signature you'd see of a, of a sidewalk <laughs> or a parking lot, <laughs> this blue signature. So this, uh, this is pretty much bare rock here, um, and you don't see uh, much of that on the Norwegian side because they have to graze through. So there's a very long history of uh, what this disappearance of lichens has meant in Finland. It's also going on in Yamal, but what the management says is they call this overgrazing, when in fact it's, it's too much trampling, the animals walking uh, on lichens. They didn't consume these lichens, they just blew and washed away. But the same narrative here, that there's too many animals uh, grazing too much, uh, is going on in West Siberia, and it has been since uh, early Soviet times, 1930s, and that's ramped up now. After this icing event and all these reindeer died in 2013, they said, well, there's too many animals and they were too weak. Dan, you had a question? So lichens are disappearing and, and, and the, but the other plant is expanding. Well, yeah, you see these, these red areas? 
These red areas are, um, are mires. These are wetlands. And that's one thing we're working on right now. The wetlands are where the willows are. And on the Finnish side, I don't have a good photo of it here. And I had one earlier where they were building the fence. To the, the willows on the Finnish side are down here. The willows on the Norwegian side are up here. Because, the, because of this high density of animals here in summer, they, keep, they, they eat the willow. And they're, they may be old willows, but they're, it's like a, a nub. You know, that some green leaf appears in the spring, they graze it back down, and then they go away, and the, it'll try to leaf out again. They'll come back a few weeks later, because they really do, um, you know, the carrying capacity uh, is such that they, they move the animals through to take advantage of the green. There's not much red. Red is green here. Think of that. Red is wetland, and that's very productive vegetation. But they really maximize how much they can use uh, there. So this is, um, in general, this is we talked about the, the shrub increasing around the Arctic has been called the greening of the Arctic. And uh, this has been a discussion going on since about, well, we, got, we had a satellite sensor uh, and an index called Normalized Differential Vegetation Index. It started, the sensor was launched in about mid-1981. So since about 1982, we've, we've had a good handle on photosynthetic activity all around uh, the northern hemisphere. And one of the first papers in Nature, after about 10 years of looking at the data, said the northern hemisphere is getting greener. It's getting more uh, productive. And this coincided with a period of warming. So the first link was made. But I, I have another about three minute film on that and where that has put us now. Because now that we're having this, this oil and gas development on the one hand and a warmer climate, yet uh, ice, the ice has a negative impact uh, on, the, on the shrubs and on the reindeer, which graze the shrubs. So let's see if I can launch about a three minute film here. So I'm Bruce Forbes. I'm research professor in global change at the Arctic Center, University of Lapland in Rovaniemi, Finland. And I've been in Finland 19 years and lead the global change research group there. Uh, so I've been working in the Russian Arctic now for about 23 years, but 10 years or so ago uh, while doing oil and gas work, uh, in nomadic Nenets reindeer herders living on the land uh, began to talk to us saying that they noticed the shrubs were increasing, and this was in fact affecting how they manage their reindeer on the land. And we thought, okay, that is very important knowledge, but how can we make that uh, in a way that scientists and the public can understand? So we do, on the one hand, research on the ground, migrating with reindeer herders, talking to them about change. Uh, on the other hand, we have very high resolution satellite imagery with us in the field. What we're finding now actually is that in situ, <laughs> uh, shrubification or foresting uh, is happening. So that uh, relatively uh, knee high or low erect shrubs, we call them, have within the lifetime of the herders grown up over the tops of the antlers of their animals. This means uh, if you're moving camp every 24 hours and you're moving with thousands of animals, animals can actually disappear into thickets of woodland. So the Nenets were right. Their observations from when they are teenagers to now uh, my age, say early mid 50s, this has happened in their lifetime. So this is why it's an issue now because their territory is, on the one hand, uh, there's climate related changes going on, more icing in winter, um, rivers freezing, up later, breaking up earlier in the spring, but you also have just issues of the vegetation change. And uh, one final point I'd make is that this entire area where we're dealing with has been classified as moderately to severely overgrazed, but the satellite indexes in the ground level studies show it's actually becoming more productive. So we have a bit of a paradox there, and that's our, our next thing we're working on, again, with the reindeer herders, <laughs> uh, is what is, <laughs> overgrazing mean, because there's, there's political context and how reindeer herding uh, is managed, but r humans and animals are affecting landscape level vegetation cover there. From a scientific perspective, we're getting a handle on this for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. What's interesting from an IPCC perspective and a public um, attention to this is there's important feedbacks from greening of the Arctic, because uh, as the Arctic comes up from shrubs uh, into a forest, uh, it's got a lower albedo. So the potential for more 
incoming solar radiation, meaning more heat retained at the ground level, is important. It would melt snow uh, sooner, and we do have green up coming sooner in the spring. We have freeze up coming later in the fall. So uh, the, the issue goes to uh, the IPCC and is in there because of this, uh, the potential feedbacks of the tundra turning into forest. That's important to understand, and that's what we're, we're trying to go uh, the next direction with this. Right, so those, there's a series of these talks developed by uh, University of the Arctic called Snowy Owl Talks, and that was one um, on the greening. So uh, this, this greening issue, as I said, was ac actually pointed out to us by the herders. We, were, we weren't looking at that, actually. We, we were not even looking at climate change because um, we were so focused on the oil and gas development for so long, and then they, they started to point out these things, and so when they said the shrubs are increasing, the first thought I had, because I'd there'd been a study in Alaska, and a colleague of mine uh, had, a, had a nature paper in 2001 where they reanalyzed old um, uh, NATO photos, uh, Cold War photos of the whole north slope of Alaska, and then they, they reshot the photos 50 years later, and they saw that shrubs were taking over uh, large parts of the North Slope. So I thought, okay, I can go find those. I'm sure Russia shot, the, sh the Soviet Union shot the same photos, and I found, I found the negatives, but they were in a lab held by the FSB in the Ekaterinburg, and they wanted a lot of money to, to access them and make prints. So I said, okay, what we'll do is we'll actually ask the shrubs, <laughs> have you been growing? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a, a dendrochronology. It's, it's like getting the information directly from the shrubs, and what, what we found uh, was exactly what the herders said, that uh, the timing of this was showed a clear uh, takeoff that coincided with the period of the warming climate. So there was a very high correlation between the increase in uh, annual growth uh, and green biomass uh, of the shrubs, and also an excellent reconstruction of summer temperatures. The, the species we chose for this, uh, Salix sonata, or so-called woolly willow, it's one of the most common and widespread uh, ones in this part of the Arctic, but it also, it goes all the way around the Arctic. It's also one of the most important ones for the reindeer eating. So I mentioned this conundrum between the, the tundra being characterized as overgrazed, yet it's becoming more productive. And how do we tease this out now? Well, you, if you know the satellite sensors, you know that uh, a pixel or a, a, the smallest pixel element that that satellite uh, sensor sees for to give you that vegetation index in the early days it was about eight kilometers on a side so uh, that's pretty low resolution and now we're down to we're working on a manuscript now with new data that's down to 250 meter resolution from Svalbard so the, the, the data have improved a lot we can't go back um, we can't go back 35 years with those data but we can calibrate uh, what we're seeing now and what we're doing with the herders uh, this summer, in fact, what we did in Fenoscandia, we saw we, we built herbivore exclosures with the Sami reindeer herders. We got permission to do that this summer on Yamal, so I'll be leading a group this year where we'll actually be building uh, reindeer exclosures in the areas where we think uh, we have everything. We have, we have a warming climate, we have an in increasing reindeer population, and we have uh, increasing uh, vegetation index <laughs> to try to figure out what's, what's going on there and if as I said, the, the government wants to now slash the number of reindeer. They, they said, the governor announced out of 275,000 animals on the Amal Peninsula last fall after the anthrax outbreak. Did anybody hear about the anthrax outbreak? Yeah. After that, the governor of the region said he wanted to cut 250,000 animals. So leave 25,000 animals uh, there because he said that it was overgrazed. So this is really a hot... Um, topic now, and uh, we're just starting to uh, wade into this, but for fortunately, they're, they're, this is uh, the director of the Department of Science and In Innovation there is actually, who's given us the permission to build these fences, is actually listening to science, so uh, we're, we're hoping we'll get a fair hearing there with this kind of work. So at a circumpolar level, if we look at the greening, we see different patterns. This is what happened. We, we pulled uh, we pulled our 
general chronological data with a bunch of colleagues from different parts of the Arctic. And these are our data here. So uh, the size of the circle tells you the sensitivity of the shrubs to uh, temperature. And then the um, uh, color of the circle tells you there's a positive summer temperature sensitivity. So those shrubs that uh, we are seeing there uh, are the most sensitive and uh, are increasing the fastest. So keep that in the back of your mind uh, as I show a, a short, I'll try to show if it'll work, a short um, animation here from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. It's showing the uh, retreat of multi-year sea ice in the circumpolar Arctic. But look at the Barrens and Kara Sea up there, where there already is no multi-year ice. Uh, but this is the period starting in 1989. Uh, 2013, so you'll see even in the parts of the Arctic Ocean that had multi-year ice, by the, by after the 2012 anomaly, it's going to be pretty much gone. So we hypothesized in that Nature Climate Change paper that this is part of the Arctic where you'd see the warming first, because it's, warm, it's already warmer than the rest of the Arctic. There's a little bit of the Gulf Stream coming up uh, over the top of the Kola Peninsula, and that's why Murmansk has been an ice-free port and home of the uh, Northern Fleet in Soviet Union and then Russia. Now watch the 2007 anomaly just passed and then the 2012 one is here. And then after that, there's very little multi-year uh, sea ice left. So again, what that previous slide showed is that uh, greening of the Arctic is not uniform, but where we see it most evident is in this part of the Arctic where we are seeing sea ice retreat in the Barents and Kara Sea. So I'm going to spend a little time before, how much time do we have left? That be a predictor of what's going to happen. Exactly, that's, that's what we argue is that you should, this is, this is the canary coal mine. This is where you should be looking to see what's going to happen elsewhere here because it's already a warm part of the Arctic. So to put these, what's happened in the last few decades into perspective, I put up two diagrams. One is uh, 2,000 years of reconstructed temperature based on all proxy sources. So this is uh, glacier. This is from um, lake sediments, sea sediments, uh, tree rings, you, any kind of proxy that you can use, uh, pollen data. All that has been applied here to build um, a temperature reconstruction for 2,000 years. And that's, that's the northern, whole northern hemisphere. On the bottom, you have a 2,000 year reconstruction just for Yamal. This is, these are from um, coniferous trees, larch, uh, pine, and spruce in the polar Urals and Yamal. Just, it's the same, same time frame of uh, 2,000 years, or same time frame, 2,000 years, but different region. This is more focused just on that area of Yamal. And here you see clearly the medieval warm period, uh, which again, if you, spoke, if you look at a circumpolar level, the, a lot of these data come from the North Atlantic. The, the um, medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age are most pronounced in the so-called North Atlantic region. So that's why Ice, you think of Greenland and Iceland being colonized um, by Norse uh, when that happened. That was during a relatively uh, warm period. And then the Little Ice Age uh, here from about mid-1300s to mid-1800s. But then when you go over to West Siberia, look at that same period here. This is, this is the uh, so-called Little Ice Age period. You see, you see quite a bit of change. It does get extremely cold down here in the beginning uh, of the 1800s. But Overall, that, that pattern of warming, cooling, it's not so different from what you see throughout the rest of the period. So I would argue that, uh, and this is where reindeer herding in, uh, developed most intensely. There was a big jump from hunting to herding during this period uh, here. But this period, <coughs> it's a warming trend, but it's not so different from other periods, what, what was going on there, something was going on to facilitate uh, and hasten the transition from 
hunting to herding, but I would argue it's not climate based on, they were already there, the people were there with the reindeer. Uh, we have, we have uh, archaeological sites going back to here with people and reindeer, but here's where you start picking up things like uh, toy sledges and um, decorated harnesses, sure signs that people had domestic animals and that they were valued. Um, but now what people have been talking about is this, kind of, this period here, this last, last few decades, the last couple decades of the 20th century and beginning of the 21st century, which as you know, the hockey stick diagram is, means we're getting into uncharted territory. But I just wanted to put these into context so you see where people are and remind us that um, there are periods we, we, we put a human <laughs> scale on what we experience. When we, when we have our lifetime of 70 years or whatever, we, we have that and we have what our grandparents and parents said. I grew up in the Northeast, so when I was a kid, we had so many snow days where we, the school was canceled because the buses couldn't go because there was so much snow. And now it's like my kids, they were just in, um, we were, I was at Dartmouth last year on sabbatical. The kids were at school in New York State. They, we had one snow storm and it wasn't a snow day. It was just enough snow that they were able to sled for two days in the whole winter. So people in the Little Ice Age, the long cold winters were normal then. If you go back, look at, you know, these are, these are the Flemish masters paintings from, these are not the, uh, those are the, um, the Dutch polders, but look at, at this period here, you know, uh, 15, mid 1500s to the early 1600s, we're, we're kind of in that area there. It's not, it's not the coldest, but it's also not the warmest by any measure, but it meant that people living in that time had it much more normal. So the River Thames froze uh, at least 23 times between 1309 and 1814. And this year, 1564, we know that Queen Elizabeth was out shooting uh, Mark's archery on the, there were frost fairs on the Thames. Uh, so this, this was this people's reality, just as now, the, the herders who we work with say they don't know what a good winter is. The, oh, they keep having these rain on snow events and these warmer winters that the elder herders tell them, um, this is the new normal. <laughs> so we're living, we're living in a long-term trajectory. It looks relatively abnormal, but as I said, they said there's been one event per decade that's bad enough to, for them to remember. And the previous one before 2013-14 was the winter of 2000. 6, 2007, well, Florian Stamler, one of my colleagues, a social anthropologist, happened to be there when it happened. And these were, there was two rain events during a 48 hour period and they caused two ice crusts to develop in the snow. That's the vegetation down there and that's the reindeer there. So they lost about 20,000 animals there compared to the winter of 2013-14. And this is, this is kind of our field work. So we've got a social anthropologist here uh, recording, a geographer working on the map, and then it's reindeer herder uh, mapping his strategy, how he deals with it, and then a Sami reindeer herder from Finland uh, comparing notes with what's been going on in Finland. So this is kind of how we do our, uh, this is field work out in the field, and then this is field work uh, at the herder's home. He has a home that he's only in during the slaughtering period, his son uh, and uh, wife uh, keep an apartment in town. And the problem is that you can see this Soviet era billboard on top. Uh, this, this area is not uh, theirs to use freely as much anymore. There's so much infrastructure uh, coming in that all the decisions they have to make about weather and climate have to be weighed against, well, can we even go that way? When the reports of the icing started to happen in real time in November of 2013, um, that herder there, Vasily, I'll try to show just a one minute clip of him explaining. He's a relatively wealthy herder. He had about uh, 3,000 animals privately owned that he was in charge of before the event. About a third of them died, about 1,000. So many herders who had less animals lost all of them. 
with 2,000 animals after the event, he still had enough to loan breeding animals to his neighbors, some of them maybe his brother or sister-in-law, whatever, uh, but he's a wealthy herder. But he's now the target of the administration who says that the herders have too many reindeer. He would be a target now for, you need to cut down your number of animals. So this is where we're getting into tricky territory. As I said, with the governance, the way the management sees the tundra is different than a way a Vasili uh, would see it, who's an active herder. So I've got my last couple slides here because I want to leave time for discussion. Uh, just to show how quickly these events unfolded, the, the rain actually started falling um, in the second week of November, and um, animals started dying that winter. In March 2014, they said, it started making the news then, 15,000 uh, reindeer, these are just some of the mo most palatable images I can show you. Uh, they're much, much worse, uh, gruesome images. But by uh, May, it was clear uh, more than 60,000 reindeer had died, and this was an, an emergency situation. So we, while I was at Dartmouth last year, we, we worked on this paper, and we think we found a link between um, what we'd call ephemeral episodes. So w what it was was during one week in November, the same week in November 2013 and 2006, we were able to use the satellite data to show that the sea ice, when it's normally increasing almost linearly, there was a severe dip. Uh, and these are days since October 1st, so you see the 30-year mean on the blue line, and then you see that uh, one, the black is 2006 week, and the uh, red is 2013 that drop meant there was open water suddenly. At the same time, there were uh, warmer temperatures, warm winds blowing uh, on land, and then uh, voila, uh, rain falling. This is, this is the line, Vasily had, was there sitting on the floor with the geographer uh, with a pen. He was drawing this line and he said, south of this line, which is there also on that photo, it was all ice. So that's a... Um, uh, satellite image um, from a, it's a, a scat is the name of the satellite so it's using backscatter from the surface and it's showing that that whole area where those blue dots are means it's it's solid ice and that area is, it doesn't look like much but it's about 27,000 square kilometers and there's no way around that these are the migration routes of the herders coming down and their their slaughterhouse is down here in Yarsley so all the herd, the herders were just about here trying to get to here for the fall slaughter when the, when the rain started. And some went back, some tried to make it through, but uh, uh, it was pretty much uh, chaos after that. So to summarize, I'd say we have, we have warming summer air temperatures, um, and these have been linked to the changes in productivity. You saw the uh, accelerating shrub growth, and the, the shrubs are increasing despite the heavy grazing by large reindeer herds sustained over decades. The, the overgrazing narrative goes back to Stalin era, 1930s. Uh, so warmer temperature have been, in, have been linked to more frequent and sustained high pressure systems, but not to sea ice retreat. Uh, we found that the big high pressures are sitting over West Siberia, uh, and we were able to see this in the shrubs. That was one thing the shrub dendrochronology data was very good for. Uh, but the dogma was that sea ice retreating was causing the greening, and we did not find that. But besides summer, uh, the winter warming, remember those, those NASA data I showed uh, with the warm, winter warming trends? So the rain on snow events have become more frequent and intense, leading to record-breaking mortality. And the regional warming has already exceeded the 1.5. We're actually about 2 degrees Celsius decadal warming. Remember the 40-year... Uh, data mean I put up. So it's, we're already beyond what the COP21 Paris Agreement of 2015, which is looking to mitigate uh, and keep us at 1.5 degrees. So we're not, we're not exactly sure what's causing this rain on snow uh, frequency and intensity to ramp up, but we think we found a uh, signal, and that was <coughs> responsible for this 61,000 animals dying. And we think it's this, these, these less than one week, about five-day periods of shrinking sea ice in the Barents and Kara Sea, 
and that allows moisture to be carried over onto the land. So if this link is real and the sea ice is continuing to retreat, the sea ice this year was out uh, almost all of November. We didn't have any rain on snow, but we didn't have any sea ice in the Barents and Kara Sea either. So what we're, what we're aiming for is that the rapid gas infrastructure, which has the potential to limit their movements, is done in a, continues to be done in a thoughtful way. If Yamal goes to full production, it's going to be about 40,000 workers on Yamal, and there's about 10,000 full-time nomads now. So that would be four times the number of uh, workers <laughs> as there are nomads. So what, what they've been doing in response to oil and gas is a transition to smaller privately owned herds because they are more nimble, they can move more quickly in the interstices as the oil and gas development goes on. And also now that these uh, icy events are becoming so widespread. I'll stop there. And if any questions or <laughs> I'm happy to try. You said several times that you were uh, doing a lot of oil and gas work. I guess you meant you were looking at the effects of oil. Exactly. Social, social and environmental impacts of the oil and gas development. Okay. So with that, yeah. the east of Yamal, in the Gidan Peninsula, mm -hmm. uh, I know there's, that's the newest area yeah. of gas development, Mesoyakskaya yeah. uh, Range, and yeah. things like that. Uh, do you see the same uh, tension between gas production, oil production, and, and reindeer herding there? Let's um, go back to... No, if I was giving an oil and gas talk, I'd have a map of the deposits here, and you'd see these deposits down here. You've got um, Gidan and uh, Taz peninsulas, and there's lots, there's lots of uh, potential to develop these fields here, and there probably will be uh, another pipeline running under the, the... There's already a pipeline running under this bay. There'll probably be another one here, and there'll probably the, the railway goes up, there's a railway up to Bovinenkovo that goes here. They're building the new link here to the LNG plant that's under construction, and they're going to build a spur over here to Noviport uh, to facilitate the construction of that uh, sub, it's going to be a submarine pipeline. But if the areas of uh, Gidan and Taz, yeah. are they also reindeer herding areas? They are, but they're not nearly as intense as this. This, this developed in um, in Soviet times as the most productive uh, reindeer herding area, and it still is. Uh, these areas do not have that in level of intensity, so the numbers of reindeer are not as high, and the density of, uh, there's not as many herders. But they don't have, they don't have the conflicts, but the same, the same issues will be there, and they're, they're very worried about the, uh, both the submarine uh, gas pipeline, because that's methane gas, and these fisheries, I, I only talked about the um, fisheries inland, but the, these fisheries are also heavily used. A gas leak there would be a major disaster. So talking about fish, um, the effects of climate changes on the fish, and also what have they been finding? You just mentioned um, the Chernobyl. Yeah. Yeah. The to the toxic yeah. toxins. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question, and I'm not the one to answer it. Um, but having worked up at that Bovinenkovo field since 1991, there has been a lot of uh, flaring of gas, and over here in the um, in the modern day. Uh, terminal too, that's oil, but they still flare gas off even in, the, even in the oil fields. And herders there did complain to us that the areas downwind, uh, the pastures were, were ruined, that the, uh, the to toxins, there's aluminum, there's all kinds of things in, the, in that gas. And it, it, do, it's, it goes up, but it's got a lot of particulate matter, and then it settles down. And the, the, the areas, kind of like around the real or stuff, you know, when, the, when that stuff settles, it's very toxic. And they said that their vegetation was being 
uh, negatively affected. They did not mention the fish, but I imagine the same up here. What, what was more damaging was the direct, during that 25 years as they were getting this field online, the direct impacts of um, building the roads and the railway. They had to block a lot of streams during the uh, summer that with the peak time when the fish were uh, running up to spawn. <laughs> um, so, because uh, they built, just, just in one stretch on there, it was like a hundred bridges built. And they said that fish disappeared in a, the whole corridor all the way along the, where the railway built. Because I, I started down here in 1991. I was up here and I was up here. The railway they built, it was like a 20 kilometers on either side, they said, the herder said, within four years of the railway built, there was no fish in any of those lakes or rivers anymore. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but toxicity was not mentioned. It was more direct impacts. And also the fact that the gas workers themselves were fishing. On the, when they get their weekend off, they drive their Vizdehad. I don't think I had a picture of that. It's a civilian tank that they use for driving across. And they would drive literally right up the riverbank, you know, put up their camp and, and put nets in the water. And so they've, the best practices at Gazprom, in this resource governance chapter I wrote, the, get, the best practices have improved a lot since 1988. I have to say, you know, Gazprom's supposed to be the evil empire and all that, but they've done a really good job of um, paying attention because Amico was a partner in there from 1989 to 1996. They pulled out in the chaos of the Yeltsin years. Amico was a partner in here. Uh, and then Gazprom and the herders got to see what best practices were. And they still ask this day, when's a Western partner <laughs> going to come back? But in the meantime, Gazprom has upped its game. They, they've, they've learned a lot how to be less destructive. And because, um, you know, if, if, if they were to go into Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, uh, now, how careful they would have to be. And that's what they saw there. They saw that you don't have to trash all the rivers and uh, lakes. You don't have to destroy sacred sites, uh, campsites, all the things that make that you and I or a gas pump worker wouldn't notice that this is a sacred site or this is an important campsite. It was only after the first few years when they came up there and they said, oh no, this is, this is an apocalypse. Like, you guys have to be much more careful. And they said, what do you mean? They said, well, why don't you ask somebody? You could have put that site over there, you know, 500 meters away, and it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference to us. But right here is the worst possible place. And they said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The consult the consultation regime has gotten better. Yeah. I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> greater ability to disregard Moscow. Like well, less and less yeah. everywhere. They, they used to be, they used to be uh, regionally, elect, regionally elected. Now you know they're, they're direct appointees. Um, and so there has been a big, there's been shakeups in Yamal and the Nenitsok Road because strategically these are providing uh, the most income directly to the government coffers. So, um, that, that Nord Stream pipeline, so there's, and that's affected the indigenous NGOs too, because they have their own, they have their own representatives. Um, they don't have much power uh, compared to say, Alaska Natives or, um, or Canadian uh, First Nations, but they do have a role to play. But then the, the, gov the governors who have been appointed by Putin have come and said, well, we want this guy in as the leader of the, indigenous NGO. So that's ruffled a few feathers. Uh, we're not sure where that's going yet, but the whole, the whole foreign agent rule right now has got everybody a bit spooked. The fact that if I give a laptop to a herder I work there, I could be seen as a foreign agent. You know, I'm giving him material, aid, even if there's no money <laughs> exchanging hands. So it's, it's a very sketchy environment. It's, it's kept vague on purpose, so if they want to create problems they can, but we have to operate with very, very high levels of transparency <laughs> to get this permission to do this work every year. <laughs> it's incredible. Sure. Tell us um, what about your work with the assessment report with the IPCC? 
Oh yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That the old one or the the one that's ramping up now. <laughs> Well, the old one, um, I, it was a learning experience. I went from a reviewer on the previous one to a, a contributing author on the last one. So I saw how the authorship worked. And there's very, it's a huge assessment. You know, there's chapters on, uh, ours was Polar Systems, but there's other ones on all kinds of things. And I have a lot of colleagues who work in there. And our chapter experience was uh, difficult because the, it was the first time they'd invited um, uh, social uh, scientists to have a direct part and the indigenous um, perspectives had a much larger role. If you see that Polar Systems chapter from 2014, uh, so the lead, the lead authors, one's a permafrost modeler and the other's a, um, a social uh, scientist. She's not a social anthropologist, she's more economist, but um, they didn't get along. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, welcome to reality, you know, you, you put two people who haven't worked together for it to, to accomplish a complex task like that in a chapter that's never before had any significant human dimensions content. So hopefully it'll go better this time. I mean, I was, I was there and I know both, I've known both of them for decades. And I was like, <laughs> I'm still on speaking terms with both of them. They are not on speaking terms anymore because <laughs> it was such a complex task. And you know, anything, anytime, anything new comes, like if you're going to put in now, you're going to have human dimensions material and cover um, all the biophysical work and cover Antarctica in one chapter. I told them, forget it. Next time Antarctica is a separate chapter, don't even think about putting that in because you have strict word limits and there's strict limits on um, what can be included. It has to be um, peer reviewed since the last assessment. And then there's a cutoff date when, it, when you can include it. And then there's a literature list, and you can only have a certain number of references there. So every word is fought over tooth and nail. For, for a chapter that's you know, maybe 40 pages long, I have to say it was a, it's a consensus document. <laughs> and it came out pretty good, but boy, I was, I was ragged at the end of it. Have, have the herds always been in that region? In, in the United States, I, I lived in Maryland near mm -hmm. Pennsylvania before, and there's what we call the snow ice line. And there's that belt where you're going to get your, pre, you know, that weather. That, has that probably moved north through the centuries? And when it was further south, did the herds move further south? And then they kind of knew better. You know, before we got involved with the animals, did they know better? They always tried to stay above that line, yeah. and they dropped down, and then it's sort of they've moved up further north now to try to stay, stay in the... Well, this, is, um, this has been a... Uh, for, for almost 100 years, it was the Soviet Union, so, but you have this, this system over here is a hunting system, so these are wild reindeer, and the Tamir herd is about... It's been up to close to nine, almost a million animals. It's declining now for different reasons. Um, but I think what you're, uh, we, we can't see tree line here. Tree line, this, Salakard is the same latitude as Rovaniemi where I live. So it's, uh, it's the Arctic Circle, 66, 33 degrees north. It's also, if you look on a National Geographic map, it's very hard to draw Arctic tree line because it's actually an ecotone. And in this place where it's flat as a pancake, there's trees, there's large trees growing up here, and there's, you know, tundra plants growing down here. So it's a, it's a huge ecotone. And the reindeer, left to their own, without any people, they'd still be doing that migration <laughs> because um, all this territory was tundra with lichens. What the, what the, when they say it's overgrazed, what that means is, like in Finland, it means the lichens have disappeared. The reason they've disappeared is because the number of animals during the snow-free season has been purposefully, since collective times, maximized. Because everybody had to produce something under collectivization. You guys are reindeer herders. You're going to produce reindeer meat. And you're going to produce as much as you can because we've got to feed the military. You know, the, <laughs> the only dip in the population you see in Yamal, and if you look at the trajectory from 1920s to now, 100 years, the only dip you see is in World War II, when, when Stalingrad was at its peak, 
because they came up here, machine gunned <laughs> as many reindeers as they could and put, took them down to feed the troops there. But then it went right back up as soon as the, as soon as the war was over. It, it, and if you see now, it's, it's up to 750. So just the number keeps going up and the population ecologists keep saying there's a limit to the carrying capacity. And uh, they've been saying that so since the 1930s, but the herders know that, well, we know, as I said, the, the tundra is becoming greener. How do you explain that? <laughs> but the, late, the reindeer left to their own, they'd, they'd still be doing the same thing because they're, they're doing it over here. They go, they go between the, they want to get up ideally to the water's edge because here in the Kara Sea, you've got cool onshore winds at a time when the, the air temperature is 25 degrees and you've got black flies and mosquitoes clouds of them, and they hate them just as much as you and I do. Does. So to stand there on the shore, the vegetation is very nutritious. You've got, you've got these salt uh, breezes blowing on, so there's, there's a lot of new minerals there. There's salt, the animals like salt, and it's windy. It's perfect, and the calves are born somewhere here, so they, they race once the calves are born to get to the coast, and once the calves can stand it, and the, and the mosquitoes start to decrease, then they start going back south. But the wild herds do the same thing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the methane holes, uh, we actually, we were camped right near one of those that in 2014 what went kind of viral. There was a video of that. <laughs> We, we, were, we were camped by the Bovenyankovo, it was in the Bovenyankovo gas field, and we were camped just outside of that. So we saw the helicopters coming over with the, with the crew and the scientists, but in general, what, Yamal has been, um, it's been warming a little, and there's, it's a lot of ice-rich permafrost. That's been the problem, that's why the oil and gas infrastructure is so expensive. So the, the bridge, the, you can't see it, there's a river here, called the Uter Bay River, and they built, it's three and a half kilometer bri railway bridge over the permafrost there. So it's the longest bridge over permafrost in the world. And I ha shudder to think what it costs. Uh, but it's all on ice-rich ground, and the Amal permafrost is already warm permafrost. If you expand this map over to all the way to Vladivostok, the deepest permafrost is in the Verhoyansk uh, region of eastern Siberia, and it's about a kilometer deep there, 1,000 meters. Yamal, it's only about, maximum is about 300 meters deep, but the active layer, the air, the layer that thaws each summer is becoming thicker, which means if, if it thaws deep enough to come into contact with an, I, uh, an ice body, it'll start to melt, and that's what we see a lot of, uh, they're called detachment slides, kind of when an ice, ice body thaws and slumps. And it's a cyclic phenomena here. So again, if you, if, you look at, if you look at the landscape evolution, I'd be hard pressed to say there's more happening now <laughs> than earlier, but the postulation is it's gonna get warmer. And you're gonna have all these reindeer and oil and gas, and the reindeer do have an impact on the vegetation. They do decrease the shrub cover uh, where they can keep it down. Once the, you saw those tall shrubs with the reindeer, and once it gets out of the zone where they can browse, it's on its way to becoming a tree. And that was what the, the short video where I was talking about showing these tree-sized shrubs. Those became tree size only since the herders were teenagers. They're in their 50s now. And they said, when we were teenagers, all these shrubs were down here. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a very dynamic place, and the, the permafrost is a, it's an open question. Could be more reindeer, more people, more, so more, more competition over more, more resources. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they want the reindeer herding to continue, they being the administration, because that iconog the, the, the imagery of the, of the ancient livelihood alongside the modern gas field is very valuable for Gazprom <laughs> propaganda. Going, look, we can, we can have gas development and ancient livelihoods. The term is called mutual coexistence. 
And that goes back to, this mutual existence goes back to Soviet times. But I had one slide there where I talked, I said mutual coexistence, you know, rhetoric versus reality. And, and in Gazprom's world, actually the, the rhetoric has started to match the reality. They really are doing best practices much better, but they also still only have about 10,000 workers. It's about even now. If it goes to full production, it might upset the apple cart, but with gas prices so volatile, <laughs> you know, Luke Oil, Luke Oil, uh, we know, remember fracking just started not too long ago. A decade ago, nobody was talking about fracking. You know, Luke Oil president said, I'd have to be crazy to build more wells up here because it's so cheap <laughs> to frack <laughs> down here. And so that, that Gazprom's model that they built, that 40 billion, it's called the Yamal Mega Project, they've already put 40 billion in that. To recover that, the model they used is outdated. And that's why, you remember, Putin was muscling um, Georgia, then Ukraine, then the EU to accept long-term gas contracts at prices that were, you know, so 10 years ago. <laughs> Everybody's going, no way, <laughs> we're not, we're not, buying, we're not gonna sign a 20 year contract at those prices, the gas, gas prices are going down. And, um, and then they grumble and hem and haw and they realize like, okay, we can't do that. So voila, we gotta build a, we gotta build a LNG plant <laughs> and send the gas <laughs> out and sell it to somewhere else cheaper. But they still have to recover that, that 40 billion uh, and that's a lot to do, and they're still planning to, Putin had just said recently that no declining gas prices are not going to stop the Yamal development. He, because he gets that question, of course, like how can, you can, how can you justify continuing to expand this? But he says, no, it will go to full production, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> I, I'm, I'd be skeptical actually, if it would, or, or if it's gonna happen soon. They have a, a schedule and the, the to my amazement, that pipeline did open on schedule, despite all the delays during the Yeltsin years and everything. Because when Putin came in, he said it's gonna be, you know, third quarter of 2012. So they were madly, they opened the railway in 2010. That was on time, they opened that December 2012. So they're hitting their marks. Uh, but I don't know if they can continue to do that if it's, if it's drying up the treasury. <laughs> we'll end there. Um, thank you again very much. There's another class here in just a couple of minutes. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you.